Now, one thing that is clear is it is utterly boring to understand the biology of the motoric aspects of your behavior. Your brain tells your spine, tells your muscles to do something and hooray, you've behaved. What's incredibly complicated is understanding the meaning of the behavior. Because in one setting, firing a gun is some appalling act and in another, it's an act of like heroic self-sacrifice. In one setting, putting your hand on top of someone else's is deeply compassionate. In another, it's a deep betrayal. The challenge for us is to understand the biology of the context of our behaviors. And that one is really, really challenging. And one thing that's clear is you are never going to really understand what's going on if you get it into your head that you're going to be able to explain everything with this is the part of the brain or the gene or the hormone or the childhood experience or the evolutionary mechanism that explains everything because it doesn't work that way. Instead, any behavior that occurs is the outcome of the biology that occurred a second before and an hour before and all the way to a million years before. Okay, so to give you some sense of this, okay, so you're in some situation, there's a, a crisis, there's a crisis, there's rioting, violence going on, people running around, and there's a stranger running at you in an agitated state. And you can't quite be sure what their facial expression is. Maybe they're angry, maybe they're frightened, maybe it's threatening. They've got something in their hand that seems like a handgun and you're standing there and you have a gun and they come running at you and you shoot. And then it turns out that what they had in their hand was a cell phone instead. And thus we ask a biological question, why did that behavior occur in you? And what's really the central point is, that's a whole hierarchy of questions. Why did that behavior occur? What went on one second before in your brain that brought about that behavior? Now to begin to understand that, the part of the brain that's at the top of the list of usual suspects is a brain region called the amygdala. You want to think about aggression and think about the brain, you think about the amygdala. If you stimulate the amygdala in an experimental lab animal, you get an outburst of aggression. Humans who have rare types of seizures that start there, rare types of tumors based in the amygdala, uncontrollable violence. If you damage the amygdala, you blunt the ability of an organism to be aggressive. Okay, so the amygdala is about violence. <clears throat> Except if you sit down your typical amygdologist and ask them what the amygdala is about, that's not the first word that's going to come out of their mouths. Because for most people studying it, what the amygdala is about is fear. Fear and anxiety and learning to be afraid. In other words, we've just learned something very interesting, which is you cannot understand the first thing about the neurobiology of violence without understanding the neurobiology of fear. And a world in which no amygdaloid neuron need be afraid, there'd be an awful lot more of us sleeping between lions and lambs. Now, the thing to begin to make sense of with the amygdala is what parts of the brain does it talk to and which regions talks to it in turn. Now, a next region that is incredibly interesting is called the insular cortex. Now, the insular cortex is, in fact, incredibly boring if you're a lab rat or any other mammal on Earth because it does something very straightforward. You bite into a piece of food and it's spoiled and rotten and fetid and rancid and all of that. And what happens is, as a result, your insular cortex activates. And it triggers all sorts of reflexes. Your stomach lurches, you gag, you spit it out. You, you, you have a gag reflex. Very useful. It keeps mammals from eating poisonous foods. And you do the same thing with human. Get a nice human volunteer who inexplicably is convinced to bite into this food that's rancid and disgusting. And they're in a brain scanner and their insular cortex activates. We do something fancier. All we have to do is think about eating something disgusting and the insular cortex activates but then something much more subtle. Sit down someone in your brain scanner and have them tell you about a time they did something miserable and rotten to some other human. Or tell them about some other occurrence of some human doing something miserable and rotten to somebody else and the insular cortex will activate. In every other mammal on earth, it does gustatory disgust. But in us, it also does moral disgust. And what that tells you is why it is if something is sufficiently morally appalling, 
we feel sick to our stomachs. It leaves a bad taste in our mouths. We feel soiled by it. We feel nauseous. We feel because our brain invented the symbolic thing of moral mores and standards some 40, 50,000 years ago and didn't invent a new part of the brain at the time. And instead, there was presumably some sort of big committee meeting. And they said, OK, moral disgust, there's there's that insular that does like food disgusters. Okay, it's in their portfolio now. Give me some duct tape. The insular cortex is now going to do moral disgust as well, and it has trouble telling the difference. And no surprise, the main part of the brain the insular cortex talks to in the human brain is the amygdala. Because once it decides this thing is disgusting, you're a couple of steps away from it being scary, it being menacing, it being something you need to act against. Now, in lots of ways, it's very cool the insular cortex does this, because suppose you see some moral ill that needs to be cured, and some of the time, that can take enormous self-sacrifice. That could take the ultimate sacrifice in some cases, and if moral outrage was this abstraction, this, dis this sort of distanced sort of state, it would be hard to pick up a head of steam to really be able to act against it. The viscera, your stomach churning, that's where the force comes to, to make a moral imperative imperative. That's great. But then there's a downside, because the insular cortex is not very good at remembering it's only a metaphor that you were feeling disgusted. And suddenly, you have that whole problem of the world of people who are disgusted by somebody's behavior, which in somebody else's eyes is just a normal, loving lifestyle. Disgust is a moving target in time and space. And there's the danger to decide that being morally disgusted by something is a pretty good litmus test for deciding between right and wrong. And we sure know all the ways in which that can get you into trouble. And probably most of all, every ideologue in history has had a brilliant intuitive feeling for how the insular cortex works, which is if you can get your minion to the point that when you talk about them, them living in the next valley, them who think differently than you, who pray differently, who love differently, if you can get your followers to the point that when you invoke them, insular cortex activate because there's something just disgusting about them, you're 90% of the way towards pulling off your successful genocide. A key to every good sort of genocidal movement is taking them and turning them into being such infestations and malignancies and whatevers that they hardly even count as human anymore.